Acts chapter 2, uh, if you're catching up on the series so far, um, we have talked about, last week we talked about the kingdom experienced a mighty rushing wind. Why did God announce the coming of the Holy Spirit as a mighty rushing wind? We answered that question last week. We paid attention to every single phrase in verses 1 and 2. We saw the significance of the day of Pentecost and why God chose that specific time. We saw what it meant for them to be all together in one place, how the Holy Spirit came suddenly. All of those had very deep, significant meanings, and we broke all of that down. Well, we're not going to get very far again today, all right? Rick Keller was laughing at me the other day. He said, whenever you finish the book of Acts in the next three to five years, <laughs> he made a joke, but we're, we're, we're going to take our time because there's so much truth packed into every phrase here. We're not going to rush through this. We're going to let the Lord do what He wants to do in our hearts. And if you're keeping up with this series, uh, you're, you're going to see how each of it builds. And that's how the Bible does. It builds line upon line, verse upon verse, precept upon precept. It all fits together. And when you read the Bible very slowly, and when you study the Bible very slowly, and you don't skip here and you don't skip there, but you just read it line for line, precept for precept, it fits together in a beautiful way. And that's what we're attempting to do with the book of Acts. So let's begin in verse number 1. And then let's read, we'll read only to verse number uh, 4. Let's begin. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind and filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared on them and rested on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now that's as far as we're going to get today because there's a lot that I want to show you. Now why are we calling these two sections of our study the kingdom experienced? Why do we choose the word experience? Well, because when it comes to something as wonderful, as precious, as deep, as what the study of the Holy Spirit is. It is very important that you and I understand that the Holy Spirit is not someone who is only studied. He is someone who is experienced. See, you take Harold, for example. You, you, you could take, you could find a, a reference sheet on Harold and you could tell me, I know a lot about Harold Kelly. You could say, uh, I, know, I, I know that he's married. I know that he has uh, a, a little girl and another baby on the way. And I know, that, I know that he's from Lexington. And I know that he is a teacher. And, and, and I know these things about him. But see, then I could say, yeah, but, but do you know Harold? You may know a lot about him, but do you know him? Have you ever prayed with him? Have you ever been to his home? Have you ever ate a meal with him? Have you ever been in a small group with him? See, I don't know a whole lot of facts about Harold. I don't even know when your birthday. When's your birthday? June 28th. Oh, it'd been really cool if it was today. Dang. But anyway, June 28th, so don't forget that. That's Harold's birthday. But see, I don't even know the man's birthday, but I can tell you I know him. See the difference? And it's not enough to read the Bible and say, oh, well, I know this about the Holy Spirit, and I know this fact, and I know this fact, and I know this fact. That's not what I'm asking today. I'm asking, have you ever experienced the power, the infilling, the being controlled, the being filled with the Holy Spirit? Have you ever experienced Him? He is not, he is not something to be learned. He is someone to be experienced. And that's why we're calling the segment of Acts the kingdom experienced. And how did the original disciples experience it? As the sound of a mighty rushing wind, we explained that. We went all through that. So if you missed that last week, you can go on our website, listen or watch the sermon. But you can understand why he came as a sound of a mighty rushing wind. It was very significant. Tracing all the way back from Genesis chapter 1 with creation all the way to the coming of the Spirit to today. Now, why is the Holy Spirit come as fire? That's what I want to address today. We understand why He came as Spirit, but now why does He come 
as fire. Well, a couple of things if you want to note this. Number one, I want you to note that fire penetrates. Fire penetrates. Whenever you catch something on fire, it's not going to touch something. It's going to actually penetrate it. And listen, when it comes to the human heart, when it comes to the human mind, when it comes to the human spirit, only the Spirit of God can penetrate the nature of a human. Do you understand what I'm saying? We deal with it all the time. We, we, we do counseling all the time. Uh, you, you take someone uh, next Sunday, I'm very excited because we deal with addictions a lot. And next Sunday, uh, Haley Rogers is going to share with the church, we are launching a new ministry uh, that several churches do. It's a national ministry, but we're going to launch one here called Celebrate Recovery. And oh, I'm so excited about this. Do you know that there are only three official Celebrate Recoveries in our region, in our area? Only three. And we're going to become the fourth official Celebrate Recovery. And we are so excited about it. But you take someone, for example, you take someone dealing with addiction. Right now we have three NA meetings a week that happen back here. And now on Thursdays, uh, we're going to begin offering Celebrate Recovery. So we deal with addiction all the time in people's lives. So you take someone who's dealing with addiction. That desire to recover may be incredibly strong. But listen, there is a difference between just recovering and being transformed. You understand what I'm saying? Only the Spirit of God can come into a nature, can come and change our nature and change our wants and change our cravings and change our desires. Only God's Spirit can come in and do that. You understand what I'm saying? I appreciate what N.A. does. I really do. And I'm friends with a lot of those guys back there. And I appreciate that. But you know, in N.A., you can't talk about Christ. That limits, that, that you're, you're, you're so limited. In N.A., you can't do those things. But see, in Celebrate Recovery, it's all about Christ and His transformation in our lives. Amen? And at the end of the day, that's what we all need. And it's the Holy Spirit that brings that transformation. You understand what I'm saying? Only, only the Holy Spirit can penetrate. Only the Holy Spirit can get down into the core of of who I am and make me a new creation where old things pass away and everything becomes new. Amen? Make sense? Listen to what he says in 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war to the flesh, according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. See, that's the purpose of our Tuesday night gatherings. See, we're not coming in here Tuesday night, and we're not just throwing up prayers and going, oh boy, let me tell you, God may hear that one. Fingers crossed. Because God may do it. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not going to get my hopes up. I'm not going to get my hopes up. But maybe this is the time God will do it. Do you, do you think God will honor prayers like that? Absolutely not. They're incredibly ineffective. Because what does the Bible say? The Bible says without faith, it's impossible to please God. See, that's why some of you, you pray, but because you don't pray in faith, the prayers are not answered. And then you're getting frustrated saying, why is God not hearing me? Well, because listen, God, God, you don't come to God with plan A and plan B and plan C so that if He doesn't come through, you're like, well, if God don't do it, then... that's not faith. And so God, God's not going to respond to prayers that lack in faith. They, they that come to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him, right? So it doesn't please God when I pray and say, well, you know, Lord, I'm just, I don't know, I'm going to try this. Maybe you will. I, I don't know, God. I'm just going to throw it out there. That's a highly ineffective prayer, and God won't honor it, and God will not answer it. So, listen, we have to come to God with the understanding because the Holy Spirit has penetrated our lives, because He has come down into the core of who we are, because He's changed our nature. Let me tell you something. You and I have an ability to pray like nothing else. Do you know why? Because when we're filled with the Holy Spirit, it is the Holy Spirit that's interceding through us. Does that make sense? 
So when I have a decision that I don't understand, I, I don't know what to do. And, and I'm going, God, I, I, I literally, I, I don't know what to do about this. What can I do? I can say, Holy Spirit, will you pray through me? Oh, God, will you help me? Holy Spirit, give me the understanding. Give me the heart of God. Give me the mind of God. And Lord, as I pray, oh, God, will you will you give me peace? And will you give me wisdom, Lord? Will you give me your counsel? Because I don't know what's best, Lord. And I don't know what to do. And I don't know which direction to go. I don't know what decision to make. Lord, I need you to show me that. And you know what that is? That's praying through the Holy Spirit. That's leaning That's leaning on all of the grace and all of the direction of the Lord in your life. And what a difference that makes. How different is that than going to the Lord and going, Lord, I tell you, I don't know what to do, but I'm just going to give it a shot. And if it works, it works. And if it don't, it don't. And I don't know what to do. I just pray you help me. And some of you are this, you're just this ball of frustration because you're not living in the power of the Holy Spirit. You're living in your own wisdom. You're living in your own strength. You're, li- you're, you're living in, in your own decision making. It makes a difference in how we pray. So listen to what it says. We, our weapons are not flesh. They are not carnal. But they have divine power. See, when we come in here Tuesday night, that's the mindset we have. When we pray, it has divine power. Do you believe that? I tell you what, the 50 who gathered last Tuesday believed that because we started praying and the Lord helped us, didn't he? He helped us. It has divine power to destroy strongholds, to destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. And listen to this, and to take every thought captive to obey Christ. Do you know the Holy Spirit gives you this ability? How many of you, don't raise your hands, but how many of you would be highly, highly embarrassed if the Lord just flashed on these big screens every thought you've had this week? How many of you would be, you would turn very red? Are we not all in that boat? Right? All of us? Are we not all there? What, what does this verse say? This verse says, no. If, if my prayer life has divine power to destroy strongholds and I have the ability through the Holy Spirit to take every thought captive, what's that saying? It's saying that the Holy Spirit has penetrated my soul. He's, pente- he's penetrated my spirit. He's penetrated my mind, my emotions, my will. He has penetrated to the deepest core of me that when ungodly things come into my mind, when negative things come into my mind, when wrong things come into my mind, through the power of the Holy Spirit, I can take it captive and I can say, no, 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 my thoughts are going to be to the obedience of Christ. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the controlling, that's the infilling, that's the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. And and listen, you have that access. But do we utilize it? Or do we let things play out in our minds? Listen, I do so much counseling. And I'm not a licensed counselor. I'm not a professional by any means. I don't even pretend it. But let me tell you what I have learned. People who are depressed, they think depressive thoughts. People who are angry, they're angry because their thoughts are filled with anger. People who are hurting, their thoughts They think hurting thoughts. That's why the Bible says a man is what he thinks. And this is how the power of the Holy Spirit comes in us. See, some of you, you were raised in in, in really bad home situations. Some of you, your parents told you you would never amount to anything. Some of you people, you've grown up hearing you'll never be this and you'll never be that. No, let me tell you, you take every thought captive to the obedience of Jesus Christ. And only the power of the Holy Spirit can enable you to do that. And then as your thoughts change, your life changes. Does that make sense? I mean, I could, I, I could stand up here and give you a big fluffy, motivational, oh, just give yourself a pat on the back and things will be... Listen, motivational speaking, don't do it. It's the power of the Holy Spirit within you. Amen? This isn't sock yourself up and make yourself feel good. It's not the power of positive thinking. 
It's the power of the Holy Spirit. And that is what enables you to take every thought captive to the obedience of Jesus. That alone will change your life. Number two, fire consumes. Fire consumes. If, you were, if this church were to catch on fire, it would be ashes, right? But if you put fire to gold or silver, what happens to it? It purifies. It purifies. Malachi chapter 3, you can go back and read. What is God's goal for us? It is to purify us. Fire to a believer is a good thing. When God puts you through fiery trials and fiery testings, it's not to consume you, it's to purify you. As a matter of fact, you can go back in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and you can read, one day we'll all stand and give an account before the Lord at the judgment seat. And you know what happened when we give an account? The Bible says that our lives are going to be made up of one or two materials. Either it's going to be made up of hay, wood, and straw, or it's going to be made up of gold, silver, and precious stone. So in other words, when I stand before God one day, the Lord's not going to say, okay, Chad, on February the 26th, you brought a sermon called Fire, you know, the Kingdom Experience, and it was on the fire of the Holy Spirit. Now let me ask you a question, Chad. Um, you're going to give an account for that day. Uh, how many people were there? He's not going to say that. He, he's, he's not going to say, let's see, Chad, you're going to give an account for Sunday, February 26th. Uh, what was your offering that day? The Lord's not going to say that. The Lord's not going to say, how many people came up to you afterward and said, oh, that's a good, good sermon, Pastor? He don't judge those things. You know what he's going to judge? He's going to judge the intent. He's going to judge the motive of my heart. See, you know as well as I know, there's a whole lot of pastors. They love to preach, but they don't love the people they're preaching to. The Lord will judge that. The Lord doesn't bless my ability to speak. He blesses the intent of my heart. And so it is in your life. He, that, that's why if you go to work with a bad attitude, you'll give an account before the Lord. Right? If, if, if you carry a, a bad attitude and you're a negative person all the time, you, you, can't, you can't get by by saying, well, I'm negative all the time because my mom is negative and that's how I grew up. Well, my dad, oh, <laughs> you should meet my dad. Boy, he's a negative person. If you knew my dad, I would make sense. To, no, you, that, that don't hold a candle to the Lord. Do you know why? Because you're a new creation in Christ. Old things should pass away. Everything should become new. Does that make sense? So we're going to give an account, and how the Lord's going to give that account is with fire. And the Bible says that the intent of our lives and the motives of our life, the way we work, the way we loved our spouses, the way we loved our kids, the way we treat the server after we go to, work, after we go to the lunch on Sunday, all of those things, the Lord's going to put fire to it. And if it's wood and straw and, 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 and these, the fire's going to consume it and we'll have nothing to give to Christ. But if it's gold and silver and precious stone, well, it's only going to purify and we'll have something beautiful to give to the Lord for our lives. Fire consumes and it purifies. Number three, fire ignites and it spreads. If I were to pour water all over this podium, what would be the ramifications? Well, it would just get wet. That's about it. But if I were to set it on fire, what would happen? Not only would this podium be set on fire, the carpet would be on fire, the table would be on fire, the cross, the stage, the doors, everything. Why? Because fire ignites and it spreads. Why does the Holy Spirit come as fire? Because it is to ignite and spread to every area of our life. I want you to think about this for a moment. Oh, this stopped me in my tracks this week. You think about Jesus and how he poured into his disciples. Oh, how he poured into it. For three years, they lived with him. For three years. And what was the result of the end of that three years? Do you remember? It was a disaster. Peter's cutting off people's ears. Everybody scattered, everybody except for John. Finally, they get back together and they're in a locked room, cowarding. And, and it's horrible. Everybody's going back to their old jobs. I mean, you think about it, they... They left everything to follow Jesus, and now it's all falling apart. 
And I want you to think about that. Jesus spent three years with these men. And at the end of that three years, they were still failures. Do you know why? Because Jesus understood there wasn't anything going to transform them. There wasn't anything going to help them but the coming of the Holy Spirit. That was it. Three years spent with the Son of God and they were still failures. It takes the power of the Holy Spirit to change us and transform us. It did for the disciples. That's why Jesus said, hey, I know you're excited. I know you see, I've spent 40 days talking about the kingdom of God. I've spent 40 days giving you many proofs that I'm alive. That's Acts chapter 1. We read all that. But then he says, you're not going to do anything. You're going to wait. You're going to pray until the Holy Spirit has come upon you. If that was the instruction for them, how much more so for us? Amen? Does that make sense today? So what does it mean for the Holy Spirit to ignite? What's that mean for the Holy Spirit to spread throughout our lives? What's it mean for Him to penetrate us, to consume us, and to spread throughout us? Well, I think it means that we begin to love the things that the Lord loves. Things like this, a white, hot zeal for the glory of God and the passion of Jesus Christ. If anything, if anything, if anything, that I think our generation of the church will stand and give an account for God for, it's our lack of zeal for the glory of God. And you know, the Bible is so basic on it. The Bible puts it in the absolute most basic terms. It says whether you eat or whether you drink or whatever you do, do it to the glory of God. Do you know what would be a wonderful inventory for you this week? And brace yourself because it would be rough to do, but it would be interesting. What if you began to take inventory of your life and you made this big list of your life and you began to say, is it to God's glory? The Lord has given me a job here. Do I do it to God's glory, yes or no? The Lord has given me this opportunity, whatever that is. Am I doing it to God's glory, yes or no? The Lord has given me this skill and this ability. Am I doing it to God's glory? Am I using it for God's glory? The Lord has given me this spouse. Am I loving them to God's glory? The Lord has put me in this church. Am I doing it to God's glory? The Lord has given me these interests, these abilities, these hobbies. Am I using them to God's glory? God has given me this much resources. This much money is what I earn. Am I using it to God's glory? You see what I'm saying? You could just go, down. the Lord has given me health. Am I using it for God's glory? The Lord has given me Buy a Bible. Am I reading it to God's glory? I mean, you could just go on and on and on and take an inventory and saying, am I really passionate about God being glorified in everything that I do? What a difference it would make. I think it means that we become concerned for the lost and we become concerned for souls. I think it means we get a hunger and a thirsting for God's word and for His righteousness. I think it means we get a greater devotion to prayer and to the things of God. See, these are the areas that increase as God's Spirit increases in our life. Now, last part for today. The Bible says in verse 4, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. This is one of my most favorite analogies in all of the Bible because it means so much to me. What does it mean to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Well, there are actually three various meanings, three shades of meaning to this word. And that's one thing you find about the original language of the Bible, or at least the New Testament in, in Greek. That there, are, there are often multiple deep meanings, right? Uh, the language is far deeper in many ways than even our English language. So take like love, for example. Uh, you know, we, we could say, well, you know, he fell in love with her, as well as you could say, I love the sports team, right? But that's not the way it is in the Greek. In the Greek, there's actually seven different kinds of love. 
seven different definitions, seven different meanings. It goes so deep. And so it is with this word filled. There's actually several really deep meanings with it. Let me give you three of them very quickly. Number one, it could carry the meaning of a wind billowing into the sails of a ship. And what would this speak of? This is, this is amazing. You picture this ship that's out in this massive sea. How is it going to get its direction? How is it going to go forward? How is it going to navigate those seas? Well, it's going to need wind to get into the sails, right? Well, this is what the Holy Spirit does for us. See, some of you feel lost today. You may work a job, but you don't feel like you're, you don't feel fulfilled. You may, you, you may be going through life. You may be paying bills and, you know, watching Netflix and, you know, having fun with life. But you just feel like something's missing. You're not, you're not navigating your life the way that you feel like God has purpose. And you don't feel significant the way God has set significance on you. On you. What do you need? You need the Holy Spirit to come and fill you. And bring that wind into the cells of your life. And let Him begin to navigate you. Make sense? Let Him push you forward. Let Him put you in the course He wants you to go. And then once you're on that course, say, Chad, what do I do? You wait for the Holy Spirit to fill you. You wait for the Holy Spirit to push you forward. Isn't that a beautiful meaning of being filled with the Spirit? This is my second favorite meaning of it. It carries the idea of being permeated. Permeated. This is, what it, this is what this Greek word filled could mean. It means, picture if I had a big garment up here and I began to dye it purple. Well, what would you see on that white garment? You would see that purple dye begin to spread, begin to dominate. See what I'm saying? Should the Holy Spirit not permeate our lives? See, what we tend to do is we put, we put work life here and then we put home life here here, and then we have church life here, and we don't like for them to touch for a lot of us. That's not what the Holy Spirit wants to do. See, the Holy Spirit wants to permeate you and fill you, give you the ability to pray just as strongly as you do here at home. Please don't raise your hands. But let me ask you a question. How many of you pray at home? I'm talking you shut the door. I'm talking you turn everything off. I'm talking you get by yourself alone and you get on your knees and you call out to the Lord. Do you ever do it? See, He wants to permeate every part of our life. How many of you go to work and, and, and hey, tomorrow is a great example because it's Monday, right? And how many of us love Mondays? What would happen if you began to pray through your Monday? Right? And the whole time you're at work, you're saying, Lord, I thank you for my job. Lord, I thank you that you give me employment. Lord, I thank you that you're meeting my needs, Lord. I thank you that you gave me the health to even work, God, because there's a lot of people that they would work if they had the health to work, and you've given me the health. Lord, thank you. Thank you for what you're doing. Help me, Lord. Help me on my job, Lord. I need greater skill. I need greater understanding, Lord. Give me the strength for this day. How different would your day be? And you see how the Holy Spirit should permeate every single aspect of our life? Have you ever wanted to kill your kids? Do you ever pray over your kids? Ever? I'm talking in the heat of it. I'm talking like they have a sharpie and they just wrote their name on the wall. Do you ever pray over your kids? Do you ever come and... And say, God, help them. Help them to never do that again. <laughs> ah, yeah, it's funny, but I'm being really serious. Help them, Lord. Help them to know that this was wrong, Lord. And help them to know that it greatly displeased me, but it even more so displeased you. And help them to know when they're about to do wrong, Lord, that they won't do it. Have you ever done that? See, that's the Holy Spirit permeating. Every aspect, everything we touch should have the fingerprints of the Holy Spirit all over it. Amen? Lastly, my favorite, my favorite illustration of this. Not only does the word fill mean to, to, to give gust of winds, not only does it mean to permeate, but listen to this, it means to be controlled. So, so watch this. It's the exact meaning of Colossians 1.9. 
Colossians 1.9 says that you would be filled with the knowledge of His will. It's a very special verse to me. Sadie and I, a few years ago, we bought a business, and it's a printing business. And in the course of that, and I was actually teaching a Wednesday night series on Colossians, and I was wrestling with an idea when I came to Colossians chapter 1, verse 9. And it helped me make my decision. We had purchased this business, and there was an ethical situation that came up where it involved a good bit of money, a good chunk of change. And Sadie and I had to decide if we were going to keep that money or if we were going to go to the person that we had purchased it from and give them that money. And I was very torn on what to do. I went to several friends and I said, well, you know, this is the circumstance, this is my situation, what would you do? And you know what all my friends told me? They said, you bought it, you signed the papers, you have a contract, it's your money, I'd keep it. But there was one problem, I didn't have peace about it, right? And how many of you know, it doesn't matter, money is what it is, but it's not worth your peace, right? How many of you know that? And some of you that own a local business, you know that you need every single dime of money that you get, right? Because people don't tell you that when you do your own business, you don't make any money. They should have big signs up somewhere that says that, right? So it's not like like that's a free vacation. It's like, Lord, I need this. I'm not, I'm not sticking it in a savings account. I'm not, we're not going on a cruise with it, God. This is, I need this. And it's rightfully mine, I think. And how many of you know, when you have to try to convince the Lord of something, it usually is not the Lord's will, right? (laughs) And I wrestled with it for several weeks. And everybody I talked to said, Chad, it's yours, I'd keep it. That's what I'd do. I don't think you should feel bad at all. It's yours, keep it. You own the business, it's yours, take it. But I knew in my heart what the Lord wanted me to do. And I knew in my heart what God expected of me. Maybe not for others, but for me, what God expected. And then I began to study Colossians 1.9. Be filled with the knowledge of His will. Now, the word filled changed everything for me because the word filled literally means to be controlled. (laughs) So what's this mean? It means that when I know what God wants for me, No matter what level or season or issue or phase or decision of life, no matter what it is, when I know what God wants, I ought to let that alone control me. Not my justifications, not my angles, not my strategies, not the way I feel, not the way my friends feel, not the way other people tell me. No. This is what God wants. And you know what? I went to the previous owner and I said... Here is this lump sum of money, and I feel like I feel like it is yours. And I wrote her the check. And let me tell you something. I felt amazing. You know why? Because I knew in that moment I had been controlled by the knowledge of God's will. Does that make sense? So see, some of you right now, you're struggling with decisions. Every single week. I sit with couples who are on the very verge of divorce. What do you think I tell them? Be controlled by the knowledge of His will. Don't be controlled by the circumstances. Don't be controlled by the feelings. Don't be controlled. Let me tell you, your heart will deceive you faster than you can turn around. Those people who tell you follow your heart, they're idiots. Don't listen to them. Because your heart will get you in trouble every single time. You think your gut's reliable? Your gut's not reliable. Only the knowledge of the Holy Spirit is reliable. You understand what I'm saying? So be filled, be controlled by the knowledge of His will. And how do you get that? By being filled with the Holy Spirit. By being filled with the Spirit of God. By inviting the Holy Spirit into your life. Not into your church life. Into your life into your marriage, into your parenting, into your grandkids, into your work and your employment, into your finances, into your health, into 
everything. And when God begins to permeate you and when he begins to fill those winds into the cells of your life and you're finally going in the direction that God wants you to go and you're being permeated by God, you're being filled and you're being controlled by the Holy Spirit. Oh, then that's when you begin to glorify God, whether you eat or whether you drink or whatsoever you do, you begin to do everything to the glory of God. Amen. So why does he come as fire? He comes to permeate. He comes to consume. He comes to fill. That's what fire does. Now, I'm going to ask Eric to come. As Eric comes, I want you to think about this for a moment. You're talking about a roller coaster ride for the disciples. Christ gets arrested. They're in the Garden of Gethsemane. And now, all of a sudden, thank you, all of a sudden, Christ is arrested. Because Christ is arrested, they do this fake trial, and he's put to death like that. I mean, no justice whatsoever. Christ is put to death almost immediately. What are they going to do? He's dead? The same people who killed Jesus is now going to be looking for them, and what are they going to do? And now all of a sudden, rumor begins to go, Christ has risen from the dead. And it was so unbelievable that even some of his followers didn't believe it until they saw it with their own eyes. Now they spend 40 days with Jesus talking about the kingdom of God. Now they watch the ascension and Christ is lifted up into heaven. And now they're commanded, go into all the world, preach the gospel, but don't do it till the Holy Spirit's empowered you. Now they're in the upper room. They don't know what's going on because they've... Their hearts are about to explode. They're ready to share the gospel. But what's Christ start? Jesus said, wait, don't leave here. Don't go. And now all of a sudden the Holy Spirit has come. And he has filled them and empowered them. What a roller coaster. But you know who else this has been a roller coaster for? Satan and the kingdom of darkness. Because let, let, let me ask you a question today. Have you ever thought about this? Have you ever thought that when the Bible teaches that the church is the mystery of God? No one saw it. The prophets couldn't see it. And you know what? Satan couldn't see it either. He couldn't see the church. It was a mystery. It was the hidden mystery of God. That God would so fill His people. See, the Holy Spirit used to come upon Ezekiel and he would prophesy. It'd come upon Hannah and she would pray. Yes, the Spirit came upon people, but now the Holy Spirit, normal, average people like me and you, the Holy Spirit would fill and he would indwell. And just like the Lord spoke to Jeremiah, he'll speak to me and you. Just like he spoke to King David, he'll speak to me and you. Isn't that something else? Just like he empowered Elisha, he'll empower me and you because it's the same spirit living inside us. Satan never, ever saw it coming. Never. And now I want you to look at it from his end. See, now he's not going to have to worry about the Spirit of God moving upon people. Now, here's what he has to worry about. Now, from now on, every believer, every single Christian is now going to have the Holy Spirit inside them that every decision, every temptation, every discouragement, they're going to have the Holy Spirit on the inside helping them. I'm talking about a fatal fatal blow to the kingdom of darkness. Do you realize what would happen if you and I would tap in to the power of the Holy Spirit in our life? If we wouldn't pray silly prayers, if we would stop praying selfish prayers, if we would just slow down and begin to pray, can you imagine the power that the Holy Spirit is ready to give your life. Power to know what to do. Power to break sin. Power to overcome temptation. Power to make good decisions. Power to hear the voice of God. Power to discern the will of God. Power to help others and know what to do. Listen, all of that is available to you today.
what's the Holy Spirit telling us? Wait. Wait. Wait until you're empowered. And that's what we're doing right now as a congregation. Tuesday, when we gather, Tuesday, we're gathering so that the Holy Spirit would fill us and teach us how we ought to pray. Just this morning, four prayer requests came in this morning, just today. Just from 9 o'clock till today. Four prayer requests. That probably puts us at close to 100 people who have messaged us and said, will your church pray for me? Beautiful. Are you going to be tapped into that? Or are you going to watch, you're just going to binge watch Netflix? You're just going to spend all Tuesday night on your phone? Are you going to come and pray? Let the Holy Spirit do in us what He so desires to do right now. Let's pray together right now. Oh God, we ask You. We ask You, oh God, for a greater infilling of Your Spirit today. For a greater, a greater infilling, Lord. A baptism of the Holy Spirit, Lord. Where You permeate us and You control us, Lord. Where You touch every area of our lives. Where it's not church here and secular here. Where it's not church here and family here or church here and business here. But God, where it's permeated in the name of Jesus. That you would teach us, Lord, that you've given us power over Satan. You've given us authority over Satan in our lives. And he does not have the authority to come and just knock us over anytime he wants. He doesn't have that authority unless we give it to him. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. That's the authority we have. So, Lord, may you help us, God. May you help us, Lord. May you help us, Lord. Help us. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.